Welcome back, everybody, to Joe Everest, the fence expert. We've got Mark Olson here in the studio. This is actually the second part of the interview. Uh, we're going to cut to here in just a minute. Uh, Mark, this part of the interview was talking about really finances and why they're important to the fence company. Yeah. Is this where I'm supposed to talk? Yeah. I talk now? Yeah, sure. Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about finances <laughs> and why they're important to your business. So that interview is coming up right now. Right now. <laughs> this is Joe Evers, the fence expert. My family has been perfecting their way of building fence for over 60 years, three generations. While there's more than one way to build a fence, I'm here to share with you our way. Let's, let's talk about that. That was something I wanted to ask you. Knowing what you know now and knowing the hurdles that you've jumped over, what, what advice would you give to a guy that is, you know, maybe he's working at a fence company, but he's been considering going out on his own, or maybe he does, he hasn't at all, but he wants to, he wants to, you know, control his own destiny. If you'd say that, what advice would you give to those guys just starting out that, that can save them some heartache in the future? Oh, that's, that's a good question. So the first thing that pops to my mind is if I would have had a mentor, a mentor probably could have helped me avoid a lot of pitfalls. Sure. You know, so find a mentor if you can, if you can't find one in your area, get with somebody outside your area. Um, now when you say mentor, a mentor in the fencing industry or a mentor in general, like a business mentor. I, th I think that it, if it's in the fence industry, uh, that's great, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. If you have a, if you, if you can find somebody in the construction industry, um, in general, like in your sure. area, yes, yeah. you need, you need a, you need somebody that's like, Hey, this is the things you're going to run into with this. Um, find somebody that's done that because business is business. It doesn't matter if it's right. fencing or if it's house building or whatever else, especially when you're in construction. Yeah. It's the principles are the same and the pitfalls are the same. You know, it's cash flow. Things that kill people are cash flow. And, that's absolutely right. And you know that, you know, that, you know, how customer relations are important. And, sure. Um, growth, managing growth is important because of cash flow. So find that mentor and that mentor, you know, it, so you're going to have a business mentor. And then I think you need two other mentors. You need an attorney and then you need yep. an accountant and you need to listen Absolutely. to both those people. Yeah. Um, and those two people should know each other. They should definitely or know each other. professionally know each other. Yeah. yeah, they absolutely should know each other and they should trust what one another is doing. Um, you know, because your accountant's going to be the one to help you set up your legal entity and make sure that you're doing things right and that you're not getting in trouble with the IRS or yep. labor department or whatever else. Absolutely. Um, but the, I don't know if you're kind of in this area, but Dave Ramsey talks a lot about some of this stuff. So absolutely. He talks about make sure that whatever you do, the first accountant I had did not have the heart of a teacher. Okay. They, all, when we went in there, they just basically looked at us like we had a third eye in the middle of our forehead because they couldn't believe we couldn't understand what they were talking about. Sure, we, sure. We were not speaking the yeah. same language. No one was born reading like a profit loss and balance sheet. No, but you need to. And if you don't understand that stuff and you have a good accountant, that has got the heart of a teacher. They'll walk you through that and say, OK, this is how P&L is laid out. This is how a balance sheet is laid out. And this is how the two tie together. Sure, sure. You know? And this is how what what made an impact for me was learning how to at a glance know where where things should be. And, and maybe it's just as a percentage, right? As a percentage, marketing should be around here. I love or, Mark. I love managing by percents. Absolutely, eight budgets. Right. Eight budgets. I know, right. I'm not a budget guy. Just <laughs> for clarity. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, and and there and I absolutely understand. There are numbers people out there that love budgets, that love living by budgets. I'm kind of the same way though. That I don't want to feel constrained. You know, I don't want to. If I see an opportunity to buy a piece of equipment. I don't want to be handcuffed saying, well, you know, what was in the budget was X, Y, and Z, you know, it's like, well, yeah, but this is an incredible opportunity and I probably won't see it again. You know, by percentages kind of gives you, I mean, I, a lot of times it's potato, potato, right? It's, it's a lot of the same, but by percentages, it gives you a little bit more flexibility. Yeah. You know, so and it's not so much driving, looking behind you at something you created a long time ago. It's like, where are we at now? And, and is this going to be okay moving forward? Absolutely. Yeah. And knowing that this is where we want to be at the end of the year, revenue wise. And I have a percentage of that set aside that I know will be spent for either material. I mean, that's, that's a big thing too, right now is being able to buy material, mm -hmm. right. And knowing that, okay, if I'm going to make X amount this year, I need to spend X amount on material, whether it's today or next six months and knowing kind of where that, you know, where your availability is on that. Your material is going up drastically this year. Is that going to change? The, I'll ask you a question. Sure. Your material is skyrocketing right now. 
does that change your cost of goods sold? Absolutely. It changes, but does it change the percentage? Well, no, because you should be charging more. Bingo. Yeah, absolutely. So the percentage doesn't change. So that gives us, but if you created a budget at the beginning of the year and you're not looking at percentages and you're just saying, well, I planned on spending $300,000 on material. Now I'm going to spend four. Right. And you, you're not a percentage guy. The percentage people just keep on trucking. Yeah. You know that. Well, because in, in you know, round numbers that don't mean anything, but if you knew that it was supposed to be 30% of your total, and like you said, it went from 300 to 400,000. Okay. Well, now my total needs to increase because it needs to be 30%. If understand that, that your numbers need to be for your business, right? Like everyone needs to figure out. Numbers aren't your numbers. Absolutely. You know, and speaking generalities, we know, right. We know a gross profit margin where we should be. Absolutely. Absolutely. We know know at the end of the day, we're all shooting for a profit percentage. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's a big thing. So we're having a, we're having a guest on live. His name's Tom Reber. And he is a huge advocate of knowing where your gross profit and your net profit need to be. You know, shooting for a gross profit of 50%, which some people, it, it's funny to see guys say, well, I could never do that in my industry. And every industry always says that, you know, whether it's a fence guy or whether it's a painting guy or a roofer, they'll say, well, 50% gross profit. Well, you must be nuts. Sometimes people get confused because they don't know. And they're, they're thinking gross profit's one thing when it's not really what it is. It's, right. They're confusing it's your income statement right below all the cost of goods. <laughs> that number right there, that's gross profit. That's gross profit. Well, and, and that's why I'm having them on is I think I think we need to be clear about gross profit versus net profit. You know, it, when I say that we make, you know, net profit of whatever it is, 10%, 12%, whatever, a lot of people say, well, you can't run a business on that. You know, that's what, that's after, that's net. So that's at the end of the day, after I've paid all my expenses, what's left. Yeah. But I, I think, and, and that's why we're having Tom on is, is to have a real conversation, try to try to help people understand the difference between gross and net. But back to our original point, if you know what your percentages are, yeah. they'll help guide you to where your total number needs to be. So and then in the middle of the year, if one of these percentages is all of a sudden really far out of whack, you can be like, oh, wow, this is right. What's going on here? If it's a fifteen hundred dollar item, that's not a big deal. But if it's a line item that's two hundred thousand dollars and it's one hundred percent over, like wow, <laughs> there's we, a problem. We've got to fix this now. Right. Well, that's the thing. So, f- just in our business, what works for me is I view it monthly, and then we meet. We have a, a like a management meeting quarterly where we say, "Hey, I've seen this two months in a row. We need to figure out like where this is trending. You know, if it's trending up, we just need to adjust for it. Like it's not catastrophic." as long as you catch it in time, yeah. you know, and, and we know, I mean, everyone in the fencing industry right now knows materials are on the rise, yeah. you know, and it doesn't matter what material we're talking about, whether it's chain link or wood or iron, aluminum, vinyl, whatever, all the prices are going up. Mm-hmm. So one thing I think that we need to really be aware of is, you know, with materials comes labor mm-hmm. and we need to really prepare for a labor increase as well. Because you see a lot of guys that are, that are retroactively, they're kind of playing defense against the material increase. Right now, we're budgeting for a labor increase. Yeah, I mean, whether whether we're talking about a national minimum wage or whatever it is we're talking about, we need to understand that the labor pool is shrinking too, just yeah. in terms of trades in general. And so I think if guys are watching this and they haven't started accounting for a labor increase, they probably ought to. Kind of going back to one thing I want to touch on. Yeah, one thing of that course. confuses a lot of people. So if the price of materials is going up, is that good for us or bad for us? Well, if you're, if you work on percentages, it's, it's fine. I should, you know, if I was going to make, let's say that I, I'm going to buy $3,000 worth of stuff and I was planning on making 10%, that's $300, right? If that stuff is now all, all of a sudden I'm paying, paying four, $4,000 for it, that's $400. I make more money Sure, as that goes up if I'm keeping the same percentages. So yeah. We shouldn't be scared of increases as long as we pass them on. That's right. I think that's right. where people get into trouble is, is we see a lot of people talking about how far out booked they are. And if you're in the residential market and you're booked out a long ways away and you don't know what those material prices are going to be because you don't have that material allocated right now today when you bid the work, that's right. you could be in a bunch of trouble. Well, you know, and that's, that's something to talk about too. So, there's several suppliers that are billing based on when the material ships. Mm-hmm. So it used to be that you could lock in your price by placing the order, you know, and it locks your price and whatever that day's price is. Well, not anymore. Currently the price is whatever the price is when that thing ships. 
So you could lock it, you know, you could place an order today, but if that doesn't ship for four weeks and the price increases between now and then, well, now you pay the increased price. Yeah, you don't pay the price when you order. This is going to eat that. Yeah. Yeah. It's you, pretty hard to make money. Well, it is. It absolutely is. And this kind of revolve. this kind of goes back to a conversation we were having before we pressed record in, in that buying material ahead of time in bulk and having it on the yard so that you know exactly what you paid for the picket, the post, the whatever it is you're selling. If you've if you've taken a deposit, you need to convert that deposit into material today. Immediately. Because that's your cost. And who cares if it goes down? Because the risk is that it's going to go up, and that's when you really lose. Yeah, the chances right now of it going down, slim to none, slim to none 100% accurate, is you know the, the one thing that is assured right now is it's going up. Yeah. You know, I haven't it, heard anybody speculating that prices are going to be going down in the next six months at least. No, no, no. So in our market, treated pine materials come down a little bit. But as compared to where it was a year ago, it's still up. Yeah. Right. So it, let's use four by four by eight pressure treated pine as an example. In my market, that post went for eight fifty a post for number one. Yeah. Well, right now, then then number one became unavailable. And then there was number two, number two, four by four by eight pressure treated pine went up to $20 a post. Now it came back down to $12.50, $12.60 a post. Mm -hmm. But so one, it's more expensive still. Number two, number two is that it's a number two, Mm -hmm. right? We're not, we still can't get number one in our market pressure treated pine post. So the price, strictly speaking, the price has come down. But I haven't seen that on chain link or vinyl yet. No, no, no. At all. Well, and I don't think you will. No. I don't think you will. You might towards the end of this year, maybe. And, it's, and with vinyl, that's even a bigger question mark because vinyl has more, you know, more inputs that go into it. Meaning petroleum is is the big one, right? And so I always tell people watch the gas pumps, and that's that'll give you a pretty good indication of what's going on with the price of vinyl. Um, but number two, that's if you can get a hold of it. It's just resin shortage. Right. Just right. Straight up. They can't, you know, it's, it's like the fun, like the, the Henry Ford saying back in the day when he's selling model A, he said, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. You better buy white, we, white vinyl right now. Yeah. That's the thing is vinyl. Like right now you can, you can get any kind of vinyl you want as long as it's six foot privacy and white, yep. you know, don't ask for almond. Don't ask for five foot privacy with a foot of lattice. Like it's just not there. There's there's some it, rule it's exceptions to that rule, but yeah, sure, general, sure, sure. In general, have a lot easier time getting the white. Right. Don't ask for any walnut colored stuff. I mean, just no get it. wood grain texture. Yeah, no. uh, that's a thing of the past for now. Now, hopefully, that comes back. But you know, from all from everyone I've talked to, don't expect that anytime soon. Yeah. So, and, and you're right. And then er, you know what we're hearing from our suppliers is that chain link. You know, the price of steel is going up. So because of ore deliveries that didn't hit the marks in last, the end of last year, you know, so we really haven't even gotten into that quite yet. So they're saying to expect price increases and limited availability. Yeah, shortage of our long lead times. That's right. Well, one of the major manufacturers uh, and suppliers of steel and chain link material has said that they'll only be stocking core line items. Mm-hmm. So, you know, think, you know, if it's residential, think four foot, 11 and a half gauge. So you probably won't find a lot of four foot nine gauge. You know, you probably won't find heavy duty fittings for two and a half inch posts, that sort of thing. No, um, you're not going to find, we've already seen green. Gone. Right, right. Brown, it's gone. Right, yeah. It, it, and there's a quote again, you can have any color vinyl coated as long as it's black. Yep. Black or galvanized. <laughs> yeah. We had, a, we had a client call up the other day. So their their entire perimeter is white vinyl coated chain link. Want some more of that? Not <laughs> yeah. We had a car run through our fence and we need some more. Ah, I've got some bad news for you. Uh, it won't be white. You know, we can put in galvanized or we can put in black on a white fence. But yeah, it's it's not going to be available, which isn't a great answer, but it's the only answer you have right now. Yeah. So lucky for us, the consumers are pretty wise to all this now. And they've been pretty understanding. Sure. They're just like, well, I guess if I want it, I'm going to choose something that's available. Well, and that's the conversation you have to have yeah. is this is what is available in the marketplace. And, you know, in this day and age, the marketplace is the United States. You know, like we can reach out to suppliers in, if we're in Missouri, I can reach out to a supplier in Texas or in California or, you know, North Carolina, wherever, but the market is the market Yeah, is it's dry when it comes to certain products. You know, you can still get Western red cedar fence pickets. Now they're more expensive, 
but they're still available. Uh, pressure treated pine eh, is number two, but you're also going to pay more for it. Yeah. So it's it's knowing your market, it's knowing what's available, and it's to your you know kind of wrap all this back around. You have to charge accordingly. You know, yeah. like I say, you, you have two choices right now. You can either make money or you can lose it. And the sure. best way to make it is allocate it quickly. And yep. if you're signing contracts for six months down the road and you don't have the material, you're taking a huge risk that I would not advise. Yeah. So that's, that's always my, it's, I always cringe when I see guys talk in the, in the Facebook groups about being six months out on work. Yeah. To me, that's a clear indication that their market is telling them that they're underpriced I for what they're 100% providing. Agree. So in every business is going to be different. Like every business has their different comfort levels. For us, I like to be about six weeks out. That's enough. That's enough workload to where if we have weather days, they're manageable. We can account for guys having paid time off, that sort of thing. Six weeks for us is our comfort zone. If we get to seven or eight weeks out, Okay, that's the market telling us that we're probably underpriced for what we're performing. Now, if we get to three weeks out, it's probably the opposite message. The market's telling us that we're overpriced for what we're providing, and we need to evaluate that. Sometimes it is what it is, though. I mean, when you know your numbers down to the penny, you know, I don't have room to move on this number. You know, and and right now that's the conversation, yeah. you know, is that we're there's no one that's making a killing. There's no fence guys buying second homes in the Bahamas. You know what I mean? But, but my, to, to get back to my point being, you know, if you're six months out, you probably need to reevaluate your numbers. I mean, that's the market telling you that you're underpriced for what you're performing. Yeah, you could be headed for disaster if you don't have all the material out getting. Well, absolutely. You might be yeah. selling jobs that you can't even get material for at any price. Well, that, I can't tell you what the price of chain link is going to be six days from now, mm-hmm. much less six weeks from now. Because you know as well as I do, suppliers are issuing five-day guarantees, if anything, on pricing. Some yeah. suppliers aren't holding prices at all, yeah. you know. And we'll tell you what it is when you order it. That's right. Well, uh, there's there's one supplier that's notorious about. We'll tell you what you paid for it after you unload it. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll send the they'll send the invoice, or if they have your card on file, they'll go ahead and charge that card, and then they'll let you know what you paid for it. Oh, uh, yeah, that would make me incredibly nervous. Uh, uh, but I don't but, think the market's there yet. That supplier needs to be have their hands slapped because that's agreed. That's, agreed. Uh, that's that's probably a supplier that's just yeah, that doesn't sound like a great supplier. They're they're that. a little out of whack. But but I'm saying my point being, yeah, you don't know where prices will be six days from now, now much less six months from now. Well, What's so, their return policy? No returns. <laughs> yeah, I'll be yeah. like it's a <laughs> I don't like the price now. <laughs> Come and get it. Yep. Yep. Well, yeah. Yeah. You, once you unload it, you're the proud owner of this stuff. Yeah. Well, well and right if it's a load of guns. <laughs> well, right now, if it's a load of anything, I mean, that if you if you order a load of any of the materials, I mean, you've got a pretty good chance that these things are going up. Yeah. And all you need to do is hold on we, it for a little while. We hedged big time at the end of the year. We hedged big time. I saw this coming and I was like. We're stocking. We stock more inventory than we've ever had in our life. But I said, you know, what? I see this coming, and I went and talked to the banker. I said, this is gonna sound crazy, but just bear with me. He said, no, I think I'm with you. Yeah, and we've got a million and a half dollars worth of inventory, which for us is huge. Yeah, and I am not regretting any of that. No, not now no. because you have it. No, just you know, having it gives you an advantage, right? Right. Now. Well, and you lock in your price. And I know some prices until I run out. So. Right. Well, so there's a question too. So are you pricing based on the cost of material that you paid for it or the current price of the material? Well, all right. So we have options, don't we? We have yeah. FIFO, we have LIFO, and then we have average cost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like I like LIFO. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely. A big so what's, what's LIFO? So FIFO is first in, first out. Yep. LIFO is last in, first out. And average cost would be the average of everything you have sitting on your yard. Right. Um, one of the things I'm really passionate about that I think fence companies do really poorly is inventory management. So yeah. if you're interested in something like that, maybe uh, we should probably do some more videos on yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's a great topic. Um, but we like to do last in, first out. So whatever we paid for at last or replacement cost, sometimes sure. we even go replacement cost. Yep. So Which I might have had it sitting on the yard for six months, and now it's worth, instead of it being worth us having to pay $6 for it, we pay $8 for it. I'm going to put the $8 cost in there and sell it at what? The markup plus that. Yeah, because you know when you go back to the market to buy, you're going to be buying at least at $8. And everybody in this else example. that doesn't have it's going to be selling it for that. Sure. It's an opportunity to basically increase profits. And I say that, 
don't yell at me because profits are what keep companies around. We have to be profitable. Yeah, we, we are not a church or a hospital. No. We're, and that's why I always tell people, we are favorite, in this to make a profit. My own favorite charity is me. <laughs> that's a good point. So that's the thing is, is I think we need to be pricing based on the current market value. Yeah, I've totally no one is, no one, you, if you would have asked me five years ago, if I was a commodity trader, I would have told you you're out of your mind. I'm a fence guy, but we are commodity traders now because we have uh, right now I have an inventory of Western Red Cedar fence pickets. And those are a commodity right now because it's a, it's a good that's worth a certain amount of money. And if I need to replace it, I will be paying more to replace it. And this is a very common concept in something like, you know, fuel. You know, if you go to a, a gas station and, you know, the news reported this morning that there's going to be a shortage, well, you can bet your dollar that that gas is going to be cost you more that day. Yeah, they've marked now, the price up right now, even though they got a tank that they bought a month ago. At yeah. A well, and they have contracts for the next four months mm -hmm. for fuel. The problem is they know that they're going to have to pay to replace that. And they know the current value of that commodity. Yep. We're in the same ball game where we know the current value of the commodity that is our fencing material. And we need, I, I believe we need to price it accordingly. The world market works that way. And it's, you know, some people might say, well, you're just taking advantage. I didn't say price gouging. I'm just no, saying right. the value of that product is now this, even though I may have paid less for it. The sure. value of that product has increased. I didn't have anything to do with that. Well, that's the thing. You know, to use random numbers, if I paid a dollar for something and right now the thing costs $2, I'm going to sell it at $2 because that is the current value of that thing. And if I need to go buy another one, I'm going to have to pay $2 for that thing anyway. The fact that I bought it for a dollar is my reward for the foresight for buying that thing. You know, so you talked about your inventory that you went to the bank. There is a cost associated with buying that material and holding it. Luckily, right now, it's really small. Correct. But there is a cost. Well, that was and a gamble, too. Exactly. There's a risk. So there's risks and there's rewards. So the reward is that the price went up. And so you get to benefit from that. But there's cost to hold that material. You know, I there's, could have totally guessed the market wrong and it plummets. And then guess who's bought material? Now I'm on the opposite side of that. Right. What we're, we're doing is hedging. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so you had to you had to secure the financing, which that doesn't happen overnight. You know, you had to prepare yourself to get to that conversation. Yep. And you had to have the space available to accept it. You had to have the land to accept it, which right now land is expensive. Land's always expensive, but land is incredibly expensive right now. So, you know. I, I, I know the comments that we'll see in this video is that, you know, you shouldn't, you, you know, you shouldn't take extra profit and you shouldn't do all, any of this. I view this as a risk reward scenario mm -hmm. and there's a cost to doing business. You know, like I said, to hold this inventory, there is a cost for me wrapping up my, you know, liquid cash in yeah. Western Red Cedar fence pickets. Now I'm not liquid for that. You know, whatever a load of these boards cost. I'm not liquid for that. I've got it tied up in fence boards and it will come back to me over time. Or maybe it doesn't. To your point, maybe tomorrow there's a whole new, you know, there's a whole new group of Western Red Cedar, you know, forests that we've never found before. And the price of Western Red Cedar falls through the floor. Well, now I'm sitting on a truckload of cedar pickets. And I'm going to have to discount it. Absolutely. I'm going to eat it. You know, I've got my cost and Hopefully we don't have to go below cost, but at the same time, I'm also not going to let them rot on my lot. So I think. Yeah. So let's say I choose to liquidate my inventory at what the cost was rather. And all of a sudden it's going to be gone tomorrow and I will have nothing. So sure. I have to, I have to use that as a tool to also maintain some healthy inventory levels without it just because if you're underpriced, it's going to, so, you know, it's going to sail off the shelves and, then you're out and then sure. you're back to that. Now I got to pay more and it puts me in a less competitive situation. That's right. It's not, does, doesn't even mean sometimes I might decide I really want a job and it's a nice job and I have the inventory on hand. It gives me a competitive advantage. As well. That's right. So I may choose to discount that a little bit. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's at your discretion. You have that opportunity. My, my thinking is, you know, it's also an opportunity cost. You know, if I, if I use these pickets on discounted work, what happens when, yep. you know, next week I come across a project where I could have used those and at full price. Get them. Right, right. Yeah, if they're not available or what do you know, the price went up in that two days, the price doubled, which, you know, what's funny is, you know, pre-pandemic, that would have been crazy to think about materials doubling. 
like overnight. Now it's like, well, I can guarantee okay. you, uh, last, uh, last May, there were some people that probably would have paid $10 a roll for toilet papers. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. That's the thing is, you know, we saw in general over, you know, over lumber in general, we saw a 300% increase on, on some items from pre pandemic to, you know, in the middle of the pandemic. Now, like Everybody I said, loves to talk about OSB that went from $7 a sheet to 30, some 35. That's right. That's right. Try being the guy that business revolves around him having access to that, you know, and that's, and that's something people don't understand when the cost of goods go up, the price has to go up. Yeah. It has to, I mean, or else that, that person doesn't get to do that business anymore. So I tell people I'm in the business of being, it doesn't do me any good if I'm not here to service you tomorrow. That's right. You know, so if I'm not here tomorrow because I've made a whole bunch of poor decisions, that doesn't help you or me. Sure. Or the, all the families that count on us. Well, that's the thing is, and if you offer a warranty, you want, you know, you're, you're telling this customer that I will be around for the terms of that warranty, yeah. you know? So, and I think it's in everybody's best interest that contractors profit so that they are around. You know, and, you know, I also wish that they are successful, too, yeah. so that when, you know, in the future, when I need additional services, they've been able to branch out into additional services yeah. because they've prospered. You know, I, I don't think that's I don't think that's a bad thing. I really don't. And unfortunately, you see it. You see it turning into a bad thing in a lot of these conversations. Yeah. Well, guys, I appreciate you staying tuned with us for so long. Uh, for now. I'm Joe Evers, the fence expert. I'm Mark Olson, not the fence expert. <laughs> We're here to remind you that good fences make good neighbors.